Hello everyone and we are back with another session of all things real estate and like I mentioned to you in the beginning every single week right we're going to have a different uh, we'll have a different person on and unlike any other week we have a special guest and today's guest we have Justin Mann with Blackstone Leasing and Management. Uh, these folks are located in Providence. They serve Massachusetts. They serve Rhode Island. Um, and before we get into kind of what they do, I um, just want to introduce him and just say thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, you should feel honored. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks for having me aboard here, uh, no. Kyle. Happy to be aboard and, and uh, get a chance to participate in this. Excellent. So first thing, um, and we ask every guest this, so we're going to ask you the same question. Sure. So pre-real estate, right? right. Pre-real estate, what did young... What did middle age, what does old <laughs> Justin man, what did you do? What you're, did you do you're before? You're dating me. Well, <laughs> I've been in real estate for the better part of 15 years, but prior to that um, or during that time, I actually used to run a company totally unrelated, uh, but in some ways related to management because we were managing bridge operations for very big boats. Um, so we were responsible for keeping them compliant and safe uh, and as they sailed all over the world and we were basically an extension of the uh, bridge operation crew and supplied everything from digital to paper and kept them compliant uh, and out of harm's way. So, all right, let's, let's break that down even yeah. easier for folks. So, bridge operate, what does that mean? Okay, so for very large boats, think yachts over 150 yeah. feet, yeah, yeah. they're treated like commercial ships. Yeah. They have to have certain digital charts and publications when and requirements, and we would supply all that it. data, keep them up to date, because um, it actually needs to be kept up to date to the day. So everything is in real time, but these boats are <sighs> literally sailing the seven seas. So we had, Yachts that were from Tahiti to uh, the Mediterranean to <clears throat> New England. So there was a reason why I asked you that, right? And the reason I asked you to explain a little further sure. was that position and that role, <clears throat> right, can somewhat be your skill set that you have there can somewhat be transferable to what you do now. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Because so Justin came from a background where he's dealing with clients. Right, so you're dealing with high end, you're dealing with super high end right. folks that have these yachts, that have these big boats and need to figure out how to schedule the sailing or whatever and whatever. And the point I guess is that you're already, the reason why Blackstone brought you on as a managing partner was because of your experience with clients right. and your customer service. So right. my field, like your field, customer service is everything. Everything. Right, so the client really is first, foremost, last, second, third, they're everything, right? So if the client's happy, we're happy. Absolutely, right? and, absolutely. And I think from, so personally, I've done a lot of work with you guys over there, and I would say that's probably part of the mantra, is that the client comes first, and happy client, happy, happy management company. Absolutely, right? without the client, we don't exist. It's right. that simple, we right. go home. So now, so how do Justin and I know each other? How do we work together? So Justin and I have probably known each other for the last five years, Yeah. right? So I'd say five years yeah, we've, we've known each other. Right. And Blackstone and, and my group work together well because I don't do leasing and they don't do sales. Correct. So it's always a good mix. And, and the reason I don't do leasing is I like to stay in my lane, right? And Justin's team, they stay in their lane. Right. So they're experts in their field, right. whereas I feel I'm an expert in my field, right? right? 100%. So I'm not, Right, so I think that's important to know where Blackstone can partner up with different, you know, realtors, different sure. sales organizations, different companies that do different things. Right. Where you take your specialty and run with it, right. and you allow the other referral partner to do their own thing. A hundred percent. So, Blackstone, let's just dig into what you guys are, who you are, and when you were established. So, Blackstone was established how many years ago? So, actually, we started working with third-party clients and became an entity that was customer-facing, client-facing, uh, back in July of 2016. Prior to that, for a number of years, we had been managing our own properties, of course, because myself and my two business partners have been owners of real estate and managing real estate for ourselves for a number of years. Um, and in fact, that's really where Blackstone came from. We took all of our learnings and all right. of the mistakes we made, which you learn pretty quickly from uh, when you're writing the checks for your own mistakes, 
off of our own properties. And that's where Blackstone was born from back in July 2016. And since then, we've grown quickly uh, and we've started working with clients all over the state and into southern Massachusetts. Uh, and we've been honored and blessed to work with so many wonderful clients out there that are really just want to participate in the real estate market mm -hmm. and build a portfolio for their own reason, whether it's one property or 100 properties. Um, and we love the opportunity to partner with them and help them do that. So one thing you said that I picked up on was <clears throat> you basically started in an incubator stage of Absolutely, managing yeah. your own stuff. Right. So the beauty of that is, right, so for three years prior to establishment and going to the public, right, you guys are able to manage 100, 200, 300 plus units of your own right. and get the kinks out. Right. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a trial and error where you just went out there and said, hey, we're going to open a management company. It was, hey, we've managed 200 plus of our own units right. and we know how to do this thing. Right. Let's bring it to the public. Right. And let's let's bring it to the public and let's let them, you know, also, you know, f you know, benefit from what we do. Right. Yeah, and, you can and benefit from our services. Yeah. <clears throat> you can even wind it back further than that. Uh, many years ago, we used to outsource the management of our properties mm -hmm. to third party companies, uh, became a little bit disillusioned with that and just felt like we could do a better job, whether it was hubris or just, a, you know, feeling like we wanted to try it ourselves. We did. And then we took it on ourselves and managed our own properties. And like I said, learned a lot over that period of time and got to a point back in July where everything came together. I was ready to take on the, man the managing partner role and really provide everything that we'd been doing for ourselves to everybody else out there. So our, our mantra is pretty simple. We mm. manage other people's properties right. the same way we manage our own. Right. So there's probably in Rhode Island... I don't know, probably 30 management companies. Maybe that's I a light know. number. Maybe 30, number 50, 100, whatever, yeah. right? So every management company has a fee structure. Sure. Right? So to explain, I guess the first question for you is if Justin and his group, and I have a property, right? And right. I say, Justin, right. here's my property. Can you rent it out for me? Sure. So I have a single family house, and I'd like to get $1,000 per month right. from you to get a tenant to be into my place, right? Sure. How much money does Justin's group take out of that $1,000 so people can understand what that means? So if right. I hire a leasing firm, what does that equate to? Yeah, it's one of the <clears> most <throat> common questions we get asked early on is, hey, what do you guys charge? And the, the better answer is, what are you getting for what you're paying for, right? So what are we doing for that fee? To answer you directly, so for your $1,000 house, mm -hmm. we collect 80% of the first month's rent to take over all of the showing, all of the in-person marketing, the leasing, the screening, the walkthrough, and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and if all we're doing is, is just doing the leasing for you, just the not leasing the right now, you're just gonna lease it. We will take it all the way up to the move-in process where we'll do the final walkthrough with that client and actually make sure, or I should say the tenant, and make sure that they're totally happy, they sign off on the property, they're accepting it in the condition that it's in, the lease is done, the move-in process is done we've handed over the keys to that to that tenant and at that point we then hand over the lease and all that information to the owner in this case you mm -hmm. um, and then we part ways we're of course there to answer questions and so on and so forth but that's a leasing only environment so all right so to break that down for folks that aren't great at math right sure <clears throat> so Justin rents out my place for a thousand dollars right okay Justin's firm takes how much 80 percent of that thousand well, which is what $800. Right. right. So Justin's firm takes $800. That's to them. 200 goes to the owner. Right. Right. Security deposit goes to the owner. Goes to the owner. So owner walks away with $200 for the first month, $1,000 for a security deposit or whatever that is agreed upon. Yeah, they're holding right? their, you know, again. And then month two, they're collecting the owner 100%. then collects 100% of the rent. Correct. So Justin's firm comes in, they screen the tenants, they do credit checks on the tenants, they do background checks on the tenants. Right. They make sure that you have the best probability of getting a successful tenant. Right. And There's we'll take no, it a step further and guarantee that tenant for a certain period right. of time. How long do you focus so usually in do a, that? So in a non-managed environment, right. we'll guarantee that tenant for the first three months. In a managed environment, we extend that significantly because we're able to control right. a lot of the factors that lead to tenant failure. So non-managed means they lease it and that's it. 
Manage means they lease it and take the management of the property. Correct. So in a non-manage, if, if, if these folks back out, if the tenant becomes a dud in the first two months, right. Justin's firm will go back out and release it for free. Right. Right. But one of the things that's really important to understand, whether you're talking about just leasing or leasing and management, the tenant screening process, the tenant selection process is probably one of the most single important factors in having an investment property because good tenants will help make your property and bad tenants and bad tenant situations can literally break your profit and loss. And I'm sure you can relate to that. Yeah, I mean, the, the building is one thing. The building right? is the one building, thing, and that's the building a static alone, structure. The building alone is, I like that. The right. building is a static structure. Right. The building is here. Right. And the you building, can control those elements. The, right. That is, a, that is a fixed asset. Right. Now, the asset that's variable right. is the rents. Sure. The tenants. Sure. I should say the assets that are variable. Yeah. The rents, the tenants. Right. The headaches. Right. The repairs the non-compliance of, of right. rent, the non-compliance of, of, of behavior, the environment, the different things. So, so a lot of folks come to me to purchase these multifamilies, right? And when buyer ABC says, hey, I'm looking at this multifamily in Seekonk, I'm looking at this multifamily in Providence, I'm looking at this multifamily in East Providence, how do I analyze it, right? So what I do is I look at first the building Yep. What's that building worth without the tenants? Sure. What's that Just, asset worth? Right. And then I say, okay, on MLS, there's X amount lease. There's, the rents are, are listed in certain figures, right? Right. Are those figures realistic? Yep. And I always tell my clients, like, hey, numbers are one thing, but realistic numbers are another thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so right now, an owner may have gotten very lucky and on a three bedroom in Providence received 1600 a floor. But what happens when these folks move out? Sure. I need to backfill that with realistic rents. Right. So my, my kind of saying to my client, what I say to these folks, I say, look it, take the 1600 and throw out the window. That's, that's a bonus. Yeah. We just hit a lottery, right? Yep. But let's be real, that number's 1200, so now we have to factor our numbers based upon that rent, yep. right? So, so that's something that we look at on our end, and that's where a Justin or someone in his organization can come in and say, okay, Mr. Client, these numbers are substantiated by the following comparable rents. Correct. And you can explain you that to them. Analysis. That's yep. just on the leasing, right? So now <clears throat> let's segue that into the full Monty or the full picture or the full, right. everything that Blackstone provides. So the next piece of business for Blackstone, right, would be the management. Correct. So on the management side, there's a million ways to skin the cat. Sure. There's folks that take a flat fee. There's folks that take a variable percentage. Right. There's folks that only do X, Y, and Z. So in a nutshell, if I hired Blackstone today to manage one of my units, what do your fee structures look like? So it's, it's pretty simple because we're really all about transparency and communication. Mm -hmm. our, our fee structure from a management perspective is we're collecting 8% of gross rent collected. Okay, We don't charge a vacancy fee. We don't charge uh, an absentee you know, unit fee or anything like that. Our, again, our model was built on if we were owning these properties, how would we manage them? Meaning what would we do mm -hmm. and what would we be comfortable charging for the service? services rendered. So one of the reasons we don't charge, for instance, a vacancy fee. If you own an investment property and you have a vacant unit, are you making any money on that unit? No, no. you're not. Well, it feels not very good if your management company is making money on that unit and you're not as the owner. Right. That doesn't feel like a partnership. We built our model on a partnership. Right. So that's an alignment of that's an alignment of, what's the word I'm looking for? But an alignment of goals, I guess you could say, right? So your goals are both our aligned. Our fortunes are tied to yours right. and yours are tied right. to so ours. So your goal is to fill the units. Right. The owner's goal is to fill the units. Right. You don't get paid in there until they're filled. Right. And the owner doesn't get paid until they're filled. hundred percent. So those two goals and those two kind of processes to get to that point are, are virtually aligned perfectly. And, you know, I'll take it a step further. Again, going back to tenants, we want to find excellent tenants for our clients that are going to stay and pay the rent on time right. and take good care of the property because again we want them to be able to generate a steady rent roll right and we'll take care of the property so we'll make sure everything is done for sure right 
So we don't want to have that tenant turnover or we don't want to have that tenant that causes a lot of problems or a lot of damage because for us, we're not charging extra when we have to deal with all those problems with the tenant. Our fee is covering however many phone calls and emails and in-person visits that takes. So we want stability for the client. They want stability for themselves. So it's a win-win and that's really what we're working towards. No, I think that's good. So Justin, so again, I'm, I'm all about being very simple. Yep. Right. Explaining things very simply. Right. So I hire Blackstone. Right. And my current rents are uh, $333 per unit. I have three units. Right. Okay. So it just happens to come to a thousand. Okay. Right. So I get a thousand dollars for building A. Right. Blackstone management takes how much? Eight percent. Which would of be that. what? So that'd be eighty dollars. Right. So I get a thousand. The first eighty goes to Blackstone. Right. The other 920 comes to, to me. Correct. Comes home, right? That's right. So with that 80, right? What do you get? What do I get? So I get what I pay for, but what am I actually Sh getting sure. in this situation? So the easiest way to talk about it, Kyle, is we become the single point of contact for everything that happens at that property. Whether it's rent collection, whether it's maintenance, whether it's customer care issues, whether it's dealing with third party vendors, whether it's dealing with the city, whatever it is, if you want as an owner, the easiest way to put this is, you get to simply sit back, have your money direct deposited in your account at the end of the month, along with a full accounting via an owner statement. But hold on a minute. Yeah. So my tenant is locked out of the house. Right. Do they call me? Nope. Who do they call? They're calling us. I get 24 it. 24-7, so 365. So, so any tenant us. issues. Any tenant issues. They're going to call the manager. They're calling us. So me, right? So I'm a big finance guy and I'm a big investment guy, right? Sure. So I like that stuff. That stuff excites me, right? Yep. So this is what I would truly call mailbox money. Right. Right? So mailbox money is when I get a check every month sent to my mailbox yep. that I didn't do anything for. Right, so it's truly passive income. So when I own a multifamily and I have a management firm in place, right. that is the ultimate ultimate definition of passive income. Absolutely, right? because right, people get into investment property because they're chasing passive income. Right. But then what they do is a lot of times they'll say, oh, okay, I'm gonna manage this myself and I'm gonna get that passive income. Well, you, that's not passive income. That's you just created income. a you a just job. created a job for yourself. Right, you just created yourself a so job. So whatever your full time job is, you just created another one. Now you have two, and, that's and now what you I have don't, two. I don't think people understand that. Is too many times people are like, hey, um, you know, I want passive income, and I'm right. gonna I'm gonna manage these ten units. Right. And I have a client now who owns probably a hundred units. Right. And this guy wants passive income. Right. He runs around like a chicken with his head cut off, right. managing all these units, he's just right. running from one to another to another. Right. That's not passive income. Right. You're not building wealth. Right. You created a job. Sure. Good for you. Sure. You have a job. And if you like doing that, that's fine. That's a that's separate okay. discussion. But I feel like with him and with a lot of folks is they can say, hey, look, I've got three easy ones mm -hmm. that manage themselves, but I got these five other ones right. that are complete catastrophes. Right. Those are the ones I'll start with the management company to try right. because I'm already getting crushed. Right. Let's give them a shot. It can't get worse. Right. right. And then from there, let me transition them into the easier ones. So now it's taken off my plate. And we've had that happen many, many times. I'm, I'm sure you do. Yeah, it had it happened many times. The idea is it allows people to scale or at least to pursue whatever goals and strategies they have without creating a separate job for themselves, right, right? Right. Allow them to truly have passive income. And one of the biggest mistakes, Kyle, that people make is they don't value their time, right? Well, that's a great point. So how much is one hour of Justin's time worth and how much is one hour of my time worth? Right. There's a number on that. Sure. So there's a value, there's a price. Sure. There's an opportunity cost. Right. Right now, I could be doing something else. Absolutely. But my opportunity cost is greater to be here right. than to be somewhere else. A hundred percent. So that's what people don't understand. Is it my best use of my time on Sunday at 6 p.m. to be at um, XYZ property fixing the plumbing under, under a sink? Probably not. Probably not. Right. So some people get discouraged by buying investment properties because they don't have the right management, right. because they don't have the right team in place. Right. They don't really understand what passive income means. Right. They create this active flow right. of work that defeats the per and honestly burns people out. Sure, it does. A lot of these a lot of these landlords get burnt out and they just and what happens when the market tanks, which it will. Right. At some point, this market will come down. These landlords will be burnt out and they will distress sell this stuff.
Right. They will just dump these things because they can't. And folks that have the ability and capacity and wherewithal to hire a management firm will pick these up at 50 cents on the dollar. And that's where the that's why real estate's so exciting to me is because that cycle never ends. It, there's always it just opportunity, keeps going. right? The opportunity. But one of the things I talk to our clients about when we're first engaging is why does your real estate investment have to be any different than a stock, a bond, or any other annuity, right? Because there's people involved, because you have humans living. Sure, right. get it. But the reality is professional property management, expert property management should allow you to turn your real estate investment into just another performing asset within that within that same, same bucket uh, of investment uh, of investments it doesn't have to be different than a stock or a bond you don't have to be engaged it doesn't right. have to you're not taking phone calls from your stock at midnight right no you're not taking phone calls from your annuity you know whether it's through an insurance policy or whatever it is on a Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning those things don't happen and they don't have to happen with an investment property it can still generate that return and there's a lot of excitement and you can talk to people about that as far as the opportunity that's available right. in real estate that's a whole separate discussion so but that's a good point right so why in my opinion is real estate and these assets better than a stock or a bond here's right. why number one I get cash flow sure right so a stock is going to give you appreciation and if it has a dividend you'll get cash flow right sure. without getting too deep into that yeah, yeah a that's bond, a bond yep. right a bond is going to spin off cash flow right right so i put ten dollars in a bond it gives me 50 cents a month for the rest of my life until the bond matures and sure. so on and so forth but it's static static there's no there's no real dynamic estate, act. right so real estate i have an asset that I pay down the pay down the debt and build equity, right? Correct. So I'm going to generate cash flow from the rents, right? But at the end of the day, I'm also going to generate equity. Right. So what happens in 30 years? In 30 years, I collected $1,000 per month, per per year, mm -hmm. right? So that's 12,000 a year times 30, whatever that number is, right. 360k. I think that's the math, right? Yeah. Quick math. So I've I've taken that 360 and put it in the bank. In my piggy bank, it's sitting there. But now in 30 years, I have a house that's paid off. So yep. now I have another 300. Yep. So I doubled my 360, right? So now I have 660 because I invested in, in an asset and a real estate investment. So if Absolutely. people can sustain that and get yep. to that 30 year point where there's no debt, slam dunk. Absolutely. Absolute slam dunk. And one, of the, and one of the great things about real estate investments, like we're talking about right now, is even in a down economy, right? So right. you own a three family apartment Good building, call. right? Yeah. Even in a down economy, properly managed, and if you bought it properly, you can cash flow your way through a down yeah. economy. Your rents are going to continue to come in. Your people still need a place to live. Maybe you need to reduce that rent a little bit to adjust mm. for the economy. Okay. But again, you're still going to be able to make that mortgage payment right. and cash flow right. yourself through it. And when the economy picks back up and the real estate market picks back up, either your rents can go up, but your asset has continued to be paid down in right. terms of your debt load. Right. Your equity is now increased as the value is increased. And you really kind of were able to sail through that tumultuous time when your stocks might have taken a huge hit. Right. Your you know your other investments might have taken a huge hit, but your real estate but your investment cash kept flow, yeah, your cash flow. Cash flow so was your there. cash flow was there. Right. Maybe the the maybe the value went down. Right. But until you value in a in a in a in a home, right. until you actually sell it, right. it's irrelevant. Right. Because right. the value, unless you need to sell it, is just on paper. Sure. So it's a paper gain or loss until I sell. Right. So it's really it's really somewhat irrelevant. So in the function of time. Right. We ask this to every guest. We're going to ask you the same question. Sure. What is your outlook for 2020 as far as the real estate market? Is it going to be good, bad, ugly? Are you interested? Are you disinterested? Are you selling? Are you going to jump off a cliff? What do you think? <laughs> We're always optimistic. Okay. There's always opportunity in the real estate market. Um, are we selling? Are we buying? We're always doing both. Good we're call. always buyers and we're always sellers. Good call. Uh, it really just depends on what the price tag is and what the opportunity is. And I would, I would argue uh, that in any market in real estate, there's always opportunity. You just may have to shift your focus to a different area. If you're very laser focused in one particular <clears throat> genre or one particular type of asset, Maybe that particular asset isn't performing as well in a particular economy. Mm -hmm. Shift your focus. So I, I like that, right? So one of the things I live by is called the ability to pivot. Right. Right. And we've Perfect. talked about this. Yeah. We've talked about this at nauseum. So 
my firm belief is people that are successful have the ability to pivot. Right. And they have the ability to go one way and at the, at the blink of an eye can change and go into another direction. Right? If right. direction A isn't working and direction B is more profitable, if direction B is more positive versus negative, Absolutely. you make that pivot and you change. Yep. Right? Absolutely. So that ability to pivot is a great way to end the show. You've been fantastic. It's been my pleasure to have you Thank guys on Thank you so much here. for having me. We this love, has been a pleasure. We love having different guests. This is great. I look forward to next week. We'll see who's on here next week to top it off. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for Appreciate having me. It. Appreciate it. Thank you. It.